the complete unaccountability of man for his actions and his nature is the bitterest draught the man of knowledge has to swallow if he has been accustomed to seeing in accountability and duty the patent of his humanity. All his evaluations, all his feelings of respect and antipathy have thereby become disvalued and false. His profoundest sentiment, which he accorded to the sufferer, the hero, rested upon an error. He may no longer praise, no longer censure, for it is absurd to praise and censure nature and necessity. As he loves a fine work of art, but does not praise it since it can do nothing for itself. As he stands before the plants, so must he stand before the actions of men and before his own. He can admire their strength, beauty, and fullness, but he may not find any merit in them. The chemical process and the strife of the elements, the torment of the sick man who yearns for an end to his sickness, are as little merits as are those states of distress and psychic convulsions which arise when we are torn back and forth by conflicting motives until we finally choose the most powerful of them, as we put it. In truth, however, until the most powerful motive chooses us. But all these motives, whatever exalted names we may give them, have grown up out of the same roots as those we believe evilly poisoned. Between good and evil actions there is no difference in kind, but at the most one of degree. Good actions are sublimated evil ones. Evil actions are coarsened, brutalized good ones. It is the individual's sole desire for self-enjoyment, together with the fear of losing it, which gratifies itself in every instance. Let a man act as he can, that is to say, as he must, whether his deeds be those of vanity, revenge, pleasure, utility, malice, cunning, or those of sacrifice, sympathy, knowledge. Degrees of intelligent judgment decide whither each person will let his desire draw him. Every society, every individual always has present an order of rank of things considered good according to which he determines his own actions and judges those of others. But this standard is continually changing. Many actions are called evil but are only stupid, because the degree of intelligence which decided for them was very low. Indeed, in a certain sense, all present actions are stupid, for the highest degree of human intelligence which can now be attained will certainly be exceeded in the future and then all our actions and judgments will seem in retrospect as circumscribed and precipitate as the actions and judgments of still existing primitive peoples now appear to us. To perceive all this can be very painful, but then comes a consolation. Such pains are birth pangs. The butterfly wants to get out of its cocoon. It tears at it, it breaks it open, then it is blinded and confused by the unfamiliar light, the realm of freedom. It is in such men as are capable of that suffering, how few they will be, that the first attempt will be made to see whether mankind could transform itself from a moral to a knowing mankind. The sun of a new gospel is casting its first beam on the topmost summits in the soul of every individual. There the mists are gathering more thickly than ever, and the brightest glitter and the gloomiest twilight lie side by side. Everything is necessity. Thus says the new knowledge, and this knowledge itself is necessity. Everything is innocence, and knowledge is the path to insight into this innocence. If pleasure, egoism, vanity are necessary for the production of the moral phenomena and their finest flower, the sense of truth and justice in knowledge, if error and aberration of the imagination was the only means by which mankind was able gradually to raise itself to this degree of self-enlightenment and self-redemption, 
who could venture to denigrate those means? Who could be despondent when he becomes aware of the goal to which those paths lead? It is true that everything in the domain of morality has become and is changeable, unsteady. Everything is in flux. But everything is also flooding forward and towards one goal. Even if the inherited habit of erroneous evaluation, loving, hating, does continue to rule in us, under the influence of increasing knowledge, it will grow weaker. A new habit, that of comprehending, not loving, not hating, surveying, is gradually implanting itself in us, on the same soil and will in thousands of years' time perhaps be strong enough to bestow on mankind the power of bringing forth the wise, innocent, conscious of innocence, man, as regularly as it now brings forth, not his antithesis, but necessary preliminary, the unwise, unjust, guilt-conscious man.